My name is Nicola Lees, uh, and I'm thrilled to be uh, chairing this session um, about development and pitching. Um, quite often, uh, the, the various elements of the pitch are discussed separately, but today um, we're talking about them together, which is really important, I think, because there are three parts to a pitch. The paper proposal, the trailer, and obviously the verbal pitch. Um, and they all have slightly different functions, which uh, we will talk about today. So I have a panel of three experts uh, with me. I've got Andrew Patterson, who's going to talk about the um, proposal. Uh, Fernando Rossi, who's going to talk about the trailer. And Richard Satin, who's going to talk about the um, verbal pitch. Uh, before we do that, um, I just want to draw your, your attention to the piece of paper that should have been on your seat. Uh, it's a proposal. Um, there are a number of mistakes in that proposal, and if you pay very close attention to the panel today, you should, by the end of the session, know exactly what those uh, mistakes are. If you'd like to mark them and put your name and uh, contact details on there um, and hand that, those papers in at the end of the session, they'll go into a drawer, and the, one, the, the first one to come out of the hat that's uh, correct wins a whole load of goodies, including this um, 100 Documentary Films book, uh, my book Greenlit, how to develop and pitch ideas. Um, DFG have also donated a year's membership, which is worth £35. And uh, Fernanda has very kindly donated $100 um, worth of vouchers for a consultation. So um, that's a, a great prize for those of you who've, who can both pay close attention and have got eagle eyes. So good luck to you. So, um, without further ado, I'd like to invite Andrea Patterson up to join me. Uh, she is currently development producer at Fresh One, and she's going to talk to us about how to write a proposal. Um, yeah, I'm just going to run through um, some very basic uh, things about writing a proposal. Um, I do some uh, training and teaching, and, and there are a lot of great concerns and quite a lot of angst that goes on about writing proposals um, and hopefully by the end of this you'll see there are some pretty simple simple rules um, that can help get your programme commissioned um, and that it's not the great angsty thing that you might think it is. Um, so, it's not working. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is the good news. The good news about writing proposals is that there really is no right and wrong way of doing it. Um, there's no magic formula, there's no big secret, um, there's a lot of common sense, um, but that's about it. Um, everyone's style and every company's style um, is different. Um, some heads of development have very, very firm ideas about how proposals should be written. Some will take a proposal and rewrite it almost entirely. Um, other companies are perfectly happy to let you submit things um, in your own style. Um, but there is some good practice um, to make sure that your, well, that your proposal's read. That's obviously the big thing that you want. Um, but we'll get on to the good practice in a minute. Um, the point about writing a proposal is that just like DIY, you need to have done your preparation and your groundwork first. Makes everything an awful lot easier. Um, what a proposal isn't is just as important as what it is. Um, what it isn't is an academic thesis, a book, a script, a magazine article, or a short story. It's very tempting to write the whole story as your pitch in your document. But what you're actually proposing is a television program or a film. You're not proposing a book. So remember that the most important thing in your proposal is the television program or the film that you are pitching, not necessarily the whole story that you're wanting to tell. The shorter you can make it and the clearer you can make it, the better. If it's waffly, if it's repetitive, you need to think very clearly about whether you know your idea well. If, if, you, if you know your idea well, you shouldn't have to repeat yourself. You can then clarify exactly what it is you want to say and make it count. You want them to keep reading. If you start saying the same thing again and again, you, they'll move on to the next proposal because they get a lot of them. Um, and the other thing it isn't is a CV. If you are a selling point, if you are Nick Broomfield, if you are Molly Deneen, um, you are the selling point of the programme. Most of us aren't in that position. 
Sometimes a company you're working for is in that position. You might want to say, you know, Fresh One um, is Jamie Oliver's company. We made Dream School. We have a sort of tradition of campaigning films. If we're pitching a campaigning film and it's coming from Fresh One, we don't need to explain that that's what we do because that is what we do. Um, but you can, if you are in an integral part of the program, explain who you are. But um, you want to wow them with the idea because that's what the audience is going to see. Okay, so what a proposal is, um, it is concise. <laughs> um, this, is the, this is the biggest mistake um, I think that I see, and I've just come from the popular factual commissioning session where one of the commissioners uh, said how sorry she felt when she got 20 page proposals through because she knew that how much work had gone into it, whereas actually, you know, if she has no interest in it, it really has been a waste of your time and you should be thinking about who you're writing for. Um, try and keep it to a page unless you've been asked for more. Um, you, want to trust, you want them to trust you with a lot of their money. Okay, so you want them to trust you and believe that you are professional. So do, the, do them the courtesy of spell checking and uh, grammar checking and making sure that your proposal looks professional. Um, yes appealing and relevant pictures. There's nothing worse than being faced with a, just a solid page of writing. If you've got some really good photos in there that reflect the tone of the programme, or if it's famous faces, this is something that will help bring your programme to life without you having to put it into words. Um, in keeping, it's quite interesting. It's good fun to write proposals for different channels. If you write something for BBC Four, it's completely different to something you would write for BBC Three. You can express the tone in the language you use, so try and keep that in mind. Modify your proposal for your audience. And your audience, of course, in this case, is your commissioner or your funder who you are trying to impress. And most importantly of all, keep it about the programme, not the topic, because you are trying to get funding for a program. Okay, so before you start, this is the groundwork. Make sure you really know your idea. You might know the person that you want to make the documentary about. You might know the topic that you want to make a documentary about. But have you worked out what your documentary is? Can you express it in words? Are the elements really clear in your mind? Saying, I want to make a documentary about aardvarks does not describe the television proposition. It's a subject area. Okay, are you going to use archive? Are you sure of the tone, the filming style? Is there a series format? And I mean that lightly or heavily, if it's going to be a series. Um, is there a presenter? Who might they be? You don't have to be certain of that. But by saying you want Davina McCall rather than David Attenborough, you are expressing something about the programme just by suggesting their name. And does it have a beginning, middle and end is also a very difficult one, often for documentary makers. Um, we made a programme for BBC One called Save Your Siblings. Well, that was its working title. Um, and it was about following a couple who were trying to have a baby that had been selected to be a match for their older child so that they could donate stem cells very moving story, but the commissioner wanted us to guarantee that there would be a match, that they would get pregnant and have the child. Now, if I could do that, I'd be a biomedical scientist, not a television uh, worker. So sometimes it can be very difficult to convince them of what is going to happen in your film, and they're going to have to take a leap of faith at some point, but as much as you can give them about that, the better. Um, and a proposal isn't the end of it. It's often the very first thing they see about your idea. So it's a work in progress. You can and you should be flexible about your programme. They're going to give you a lot of money, hopefully, to make a programme. There's something in it for them, whether it's a funder or a channel. They're going to have input, and a lot of the time their input is brilliant. So try not to be too rigid about what you're writing. But while you're writing it, you should be enthusiastic about what you want it to be. Okay, so also, you must know who you're writing for. There are many commissioners, there are many slots, there are many channels. Your audience for your proposal is just as important as the audience for your documentary. 
And in order to do that, you should do your research. Do them the courtesy of knowing who they are, what they commissioned, what they've commissioned in the past, whether it's right for them, whether they have any money to commission something at that time. It's just good practice. So this is, these are the very common questions. It's about the layout. Your title is so important. You should put a lot of thought into your title, because if it's a good one, it can get commissioned without them really knowing what the program is sometimes. Um, there's a rumour, and it may not be true, that uh, Misbehaving Mums-to-Be on BBC Three was originally called Up the Duff and Out of Puff. It was about young teenage mums who were smoking and showing them what that was doing to their pregnancy. Um, at the time, as far as we know, it could be a rumour. If anyone knows the whole story, I'd love to hear it. Um, but they just went in with, it's about teenagers who smoke in their pregnancy and it's called Up the Duff and Out of Puff. And the commissioner went, that's hilarious. I want to work with you on this project. So don't underestimate the importance of your title. Um, then there's a tagline. This is used very often in America, less so in Britain. But, you know, if you've got a good one, why not use it? You can say a lot in a few words. Um, some of you may know that Alien was apparently commissioned on three words, which was Jaws in space. And everyone went, brilliant. Um, so it, they can be really, really effective. But if you don't have one, it really doesn't matter, especially in the UK. Um, a seller. This is quite often very good for specialist factual if you're doing science or history, um, or you've got a fantastic statistic or little known fact. You know, something that really captures the imagination and makes them want to carry on reading, because that's the whole point. Um, first paragraph is your basics. Um, I had a quick look at someone's proposal for them today, um, and it didn't say that it was a drama documentary until the very last line of the front page. <coughs> if you're a commissioner, you kind of need to know that right up top. Um, so make sure that you are very clear about what it is you're asking to commission right up top. The body... It's where you expand. It's where you say what it is that you are going to see, that what is, that what is going to drive the program. You can expand on your characters. You can, if it's a format, expand on the format. If it's um, a documentary and you know someone's got a court case and you know someone's moving out of home and you know someone's pregnant, you really need to fill in all that, the meat of your program there. And sometimes a territory, a subject area, can feel really familiar, and that can really turn commissioners off. If, if there's been a massive hit series on gypsy weddings, no one else is going to want to commission something on gypsy weddings because there's been this massive hit. So you have to be very clear sometimes what differentiates yours from the programme that is going to spring into their mind immediately. So... Tell them why this isn't what they've seen before if there's an obvious competition with another programme. Okay. Language. Very easy, especially in specialist factual history arts, to be too clever, to use jargon that people don't understand. Um, and let's face it, nobody likes to feel stupid. So if you're going to use words that you ha they might have to look up in a dictionary, I'd probably not use that word. It's not being patronising, it's just not making people feel stupid. Um, so steer away from words that most intelligent people would not know and might have to look up. Um, academic and clever is good, but is it relevant? And are they going to understand it? Is it going to help them keep reading? Don't make promises you can't deliver. You're going to have an ongoing relationship with this person. You don't want to say, we've got access to David Cameron, when you haven't. That's hard access to get. Don't promise if you can't deliver. Show, don't tell is really important. If you stick lots of words like extraordinary, exciting, amazing, it will be incredible, this, that. One, you're building yourself up to deliver something you may not be able to, and two, if it's exciting, incredible, and amazing, tell them why. Don't tell them that it is. Show them that it is. Show them the elements of your programme that make it really genuinely exciting. They'll get that from your proposal. 
Okay, do be concise. This is something that generally um, people find very hard, but if you've got a clear idea, you can do it. Be positive. I remember my first proposal that I wrote contained the line, something along the lines of, probably, maybe, if we can, we might. Have a little faith in yourself. Use the word we will. You know, be positive. You want them to be positive about your idea too. Use your computer, spell check, but always, always, always read it on paper. Because it might print out all jumbled up. You never know. Computers do strange things. And also, it's easier to spot things when it's not on a screen. So always proofread. OK, so these are the physical elements that I would recommend that you put on every single proposal. Your title. I have had a proposal sent to me with no title, which kind of, uh, yeah. You're trying to sell something. The title's really important. Make it good. Ron Seal, for people who don't know the brand, uh, their motto is, it does what it says on the tin. Sometimes those titles are the best ones. So is it good? Is it a pun? Is it funny? Think about what your favorite titles are and see if you can work on them to come up with something for yours. Okay, your episode number and duration. We went to Sky with a program and said, uh, 12 hours, thinking we were being a bit cheeky. That's a massive commission. And they came back and went, give us 20. So try not to undersell yourself because that's, you know, sometimes you can be a bit cautious but equally don't oversell yourself because commissioners will see through that straight away. Suggested slot. It shows you've thought about the tone. It shows you've thought about what they commission. If you say a 7.30 BBC One program, you know that that's really different to a 10 o'clock BBC Four program or you know, an E4 program that's on at nine. These are very different slots. So know your slot and suggest it. Length, keep it short. They aren't going to get to the end of a first page unless you've caught their imagination already. So make your first page really count. They'll ask for more if they're interested. Um, what channel it's going to be? Some commissioners deal with more than one channel. So let them know. It used to be that Channel 4 and More 4 had some of the same commissioners. You must make sure you tell them which channel it is that you're pitching to. Some of the... Um, the French channels yesterday, you know, those commissions also worked with more than one channel. It's easy to forget to put who you are or your company on the proposal. Often commissioners print things out to read them, take them on the tube. If they've forgotten who that's come from, that's a bit of a disaster for you. So make sure that even if it's just your logo in the corner, that they know who it's come from. Your contact details. This is all about making everything as easy as possible for them. So if there's an email address or a phone number just in the footer at the bottom, it means if they're excited about it, they can ring you. If they find it in their book, they can call you. They know where it's come from. And pictures. People often forget pictures. They can really bring it to life. They can really help with the cell, with the tone, with the, with the people who are taking part. Um, but a word of warning, some firewalls don't let them through. So don't press go at a deadline and then come in the next morning and find your email's been rejected because your file's too big. If you're going to do that, send it at 3 o'clock and make sure that it doesn't bounce back before the deadline. I've had that happen. OK, so this is a very... Um, this is not my best work. I'm slightly embarrassed to be showing it, but it kind of proves the point. Um, this is a very short proposal that I wrote in about two hours. Ooh, could you close it again for a second? Um, I wrote it very quickly um, because it was a current affairs commission. And the point of this is it's not just documentary commissioners that commission documentaries. This was commissioned through current affairs. If it's a relevant topic, why not pitch it to current affairs? Um, it's short. It's not particularly well written. But it did get commissioned by the next morning. Um, and it just shows that a clear idea, written briefly, from somebody who they trust, an executive producer that they trust, can get a commission very, very quickly. Um, for those of you who were in Britain in 2008, one of the biggest stories was the disappearance of a young girl called Shannon Matthews. Um, it was the biggest story for about two weeks. 
and then it turned into an even bigger story when they arrested her mother um, for conspiring to kidnap a child. She had basically teamed up with someone else, drugged her daughter, and hidden her. And the reason that she'd done this was because shortly beforehand, a young girl called Madeleine McCann went missing. And that family was sent loads of money to help try and find her. And so later on, this unfolded that this was the motivation and this is what had happened. And the day that Karen Matthews was arrested, um, my exec sent an email, one line to ITV saying, how about a very fast turnaround documentary on those people who go on TV and appeal for information when they're actually the person who committed the crime? And he wrote back, sure, send me a page. I've got a meeting tomorrow morning. That was all the conversation we had. I was sent that email, and I wrote this proposal. So even though it's not particularly brilliant, it does illustrate a lot of the points that we've been talking about. ITV1, not ITV2 or 3, commissions crossover. It has a title. It has pictures. These pictures are of really well-known cases in the UK. It's Tracy Andrews. Uh, I think it's... Fardy Nasri, Karen Matthews is uh, the lady that in sort of in the middle, and then the chap on the end I can't remember, but he is one of the ones that ended up being featured. You've got one times 60, that's all you need to put in, it's a one hour programme, it doesn't need lots of text, it has a title. It's the biggest story in the country at the time, so the seller was her TV appeal, that's a direct quote from her going on TV in tears going help me find my daughter. It illustrates the point up top. Um, a little bit further down, um, it just tells you that it's an emotive and headline-grabbing single for ITV1. It's, we're going to investigate the phenomenon of criminals who cry crocodile tears. So it's investigate, phenomenon. These are current affairs -y words. Okay, so it's about tone and using the language. If you scroll down a little bit further... Thank you. Um, the next paragraph, all I'd done is look up some case studies to illustrate that there was a variety of topics, a variety of motivations. So we've got jealous rage, planned executions for money. There was a woman in America who drowned her children because her boyfriend didn't like them. Um, and also Shannon, um, Shannon being hid for reward money. Um, and then the next bit down contains the elements, the things we're going to use. We're going to use archive. We're going to use interviews with the police who were involved. We're going to find out how police use these appeals to investigate. They're actually a test. We're going to get expert psychologists in to analyse these features to see how these people work. This, these are what the programme is going to be. We haven't mentioned any names, any cases yet, other than Karen Matthews' connection. So it's about what the programme is, not necessarily what the stories are. And if you scroll down a little bit further, just a couple of questions that we hope to answer. You know, what makes people do this type of thing? How dare they? How do you know when they're lying? Um, and then all that's on the second page is a list, and you can see literally two or three lines. These are the types of stories that we're going to investigate. It proves there are a lot of these stories, so we should be able to fill an hour. It's not necessarily expanding the stories as they were. You'll also notice at the bottom of the page, there's the logo of the company and an email address for contact. So I know that's been very fast, um, but that's a quick romp through writing proposals. Um, everyone has their own way of doing it, so there may be, uh, there may be differences of opinion, but that's where I would start. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on. Well, you should definitely know exactly where those mistakes are in that proposal now after that very thorough um, explanation. We're going to move on now to Taste of Tates with Fernanda Rossi. If you'd like to come up, Fernanda. Um, there will be time for questions at the end, by the way, so if you keep all your questions um, in mind, uh, once we've got all the panel together, you can, we can um, have a bit of a discussion. Um, so Fernanda started out as a film editor. We're very lucky to have her with us today. She's actually come all the way from New York. 
Uh, she's not very often in the country, she, although she does seem to go to Scotland quite regularly. <laughs> um, so she's, um, she's an internationally renowned story consultant and has helped more than 300 filmmakers um, troubleshoot their documentaries, um, including Academy Award nominees The Garden and Recycle Life. And she also worked on Marathon Boy, which premiered last year at Sheffield Dockfest. Um, she's the author of Trailer Mechanics, which is a book about how to make trailers to sell your documentary film. Um, and I believe there's a new edition coming out yeah. soon. Um, and so she's going to talk to us about trailers, pitch tapes, teasers, and maybe you can start with telling us what on earth the difference is. Yes, thank you so oh, much. Have we, um, have we got a mic? Yeah. If you want, oh, if you want that mic. Well, just there. Oh, that um, I'll be standing up because I'm very jet lagged if I sit down I will fall asleep immediately so um, bear with me if I keep moving I'll get through this without blinking um, thank you Andrea for that wonderful overview it helps me a lot because um, when I talk about tasters it's more like an eight-hour workshop and I have to say the key things in 20 minutes so the fact that we went over those things already give me a good platform I would like to ask you how many of you are right now working on a trailer not finished you are thinking it through great how many of you are done with your trailer and you think it's great okay hands go down at that moment. <laughs> How many of you had a very successful trailer and you raised a lot of money with it? Congratulations. Um, okay, so the tricky thing is that uh, trailers and tasters, as you guys call it here, evolve all the time. Ten years ago, you just needed that wonderful piece of paper with those characteristics and that was it. And you could discuss it over beers and that was fine. And today everybody says, yeah, that's very nice. Can you show me something? And um, that means an audiovisual something. Um, so it has many of the characteristics of your pitch and your synopsis, but obviously what happens when people have to jump into the audiovisual form, either you get frozen because that's your media and you have to be great at that, so people put a lot of pressure on themselves and they get paralyzed, or on the other end, people go, oh, Free for all, I can do whatever I want. And they go crazy with their trailer. Um, so I have to remind you, it's a working tool. It's not your film. You don't have to show all your talent there. It's a working tool. And it's a persuasion tool, like the pitch and the proposal. It's your audiovisual persuasion tool. The proposal will be your written, written persuasion tool, and the pitch will be your verbal persuasion tool. So in this audiovisual persu uh, persuasion tool, you have to convey some key things. So before I go into that, I will give you the official definition of taster. And again, whatever you want to call it. In the States, they call it uh, trailers or demos. Um, in, in writing, you will find the words work in progress or sample. So it doesn't matter the word. Um, but if a commissioning editor is saying a, a particular word, work with that. You know, don't correct them. They go, oh, no, uh, you know, sisters, it's not too American, and I'm American. You know, you, you don't correct the people that you're trying to get money from. You always say yes to them. And, oh, yeah, if they go demo, you go with demo. If they say tester, you say tester. Uh, whatever they say is the correct word. Uh, but just be aware of this, because if you go to international markets, you will be a bit dizzy with, they will say, trailer, I don't have a trailer, I have a demo. It's the same thing. Don't worry. You have what they need so and be prepared to be snubbed off also you know I say trailers we don't use trailers and you go oh my god don't you what, what do you ask oh we ask for tasters oh okay I have a taster too and you show exactly the same that you were planning to show anyway so forget about the words as long as it's a fundraising audiovisual something you're good so the definition says that a taster is an audiovisual pitch one to 20 minutes long, and I'll talk about time, don't worry, of excerpts of a film to be or in progress. So the film may not exist at all, or you might be shooting already, for fundraising purposes. Uh, so audiovisual pitch, I explained why already. Um, and because it's an audiovisual pitch, 
It will have many of the characteristics that Andrea explained already. I will just go over them very quickly. Um, time, one to 20 minutes. That's crazy. They're so, so different to cut for one that cut to 20. Uh, well, that means because it has different purposes. So I'll give you a quick list. Uh, one minute is qualifying for, for example, Sheffield Meat Market. They will ask you for a minute uh, to put on their website and be selected for the meat market. Uh, people will say informally, oh, just send me a minute. They mean two or three. Um, so a minute is good for breaking the ice, first introductions, qualifying for certain places. Two to five minutes is uh, good for crowdfunding, if you're going to put something on Indiegogo or Just Give or any of those platforms. Uh, five minutes it tops. Uh, it's very hard to watch online beyond that point. Uh, people start clicking through. Uh, first meetings um, and TV tasters for formatted programming tend to be up to five minutes and not longer. Um, anything beyond that, they say, well, just give me a, a pilot. <laughs> give me the, if you're going to go for six minutes, just you might as well give me everything so I know what's about. Um, seven minutes is good for fundraising events. I know they don't do that much in Europe, especially now with crowdfunding. You don't need to organize a live event. But if you do a panel or something, seven minutes is good length for live audiences. Ten minutes is proposed uh, for um, grant foundations. That's kind of like their mark. And 20 minutes is for highly competitive uh, foundations, like ITVS International, for example, or Sundance Institute. They will ask you um, for something long. Why? Because they get so many submissions, the way to uh, discourage people is asking something that is long and it will require a lot of money and knowing your story. So that's a quick rundown of times. So do you cut each one of those? No, you cut the 10 minute generic, like the overview of the idea. You have it there on your drive. And then when you have deadlines, you cut for that, very much like a proposal. You have your backbone kind of there and sort it out. And from there, you cut all the other versions that you need. Because if you're going to start cutting from scratch every time, it will be a lot of effort and money. So moving on to characteristics, excerpts of a film to be. I work in rough cuts also and scripts. And people say, but you want me to come up with the story when I'm still trying to figure it out? Yes. Exactly. You have to, with a taster, talk about a film that doesn't exist, that you don't even know where it's going to be, but has to look like it's already happening. Um, there are ways to do that. Um, as in a proposal, introduce the character off the bat, right away. No movie pants, no credits, nobody cares who was your PA. Uh, just go for introducing the character. And if it's a topic-based film, the premise of the film. In the middle, you want scenes. You don't want a choppy, flashy thing jumping around, even if it's for formatted TV. Even if you're selling a concept, you want people to be able to follow. And that's where people who are very confident about their storytelling skills or, their, uh, or, or, or they love being in the cutting room go crazy. They hire a, a top-notch editor, and they do a fantastic teaser, which is great for your website, but not necessarily great to sell a story. So the trailer has to show there is a story. How do you show there is a story? And I know there was a session earlier today about that. By having scenes, not just sound bites of people in a, in a machine gun style. Uh, so you want scenes, things happening with beginning, middle, and end. And towards the end, you want to make sure you have a cliffhanger. And a cliffhanger is a way of saying there is more to this just put some money, and we might be able to tell you what's happening next. So that cliffhanger is extremely important. And many people get so excited in the edit room, and they start um, wrapping it up, and it looks like a lovely short. Well, uh, you're risking being given a pat on the back and told, great job, go to the festivals. You're going to do great with this short. So it gives psychological closure. People go, OK, I get it, I'm done. Um, and they will, um, it will feel like a PSA, is that the word here, public service announcement, um, or, or a, a non-profit call to action. So very careful not to put a nice ending with credits and everything, because it will give the feeling that it's done. I have that happen to somebody. She had a short, actually, that did very well in the festival circuit, and she realized that there was a bigger film. And I said, you need to recut that. 
And she said, no, 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 I think I can submit the short. I said, don't do that. She submitted the short, and she was reject, rejected flat out. And she said, how? The festival said yes, the audience is saying yes. What are they not getting? I said, the problem is they're getting it. They're getting it all. So they're done. Why would they finance something? And she was said, told many times, oh, it's lovely. I, I'm so happy you did so well. And she would submit reams of paper explaining how there was more to it. There was no amount of paper, written word, that could convince the damage that the audiovisual material has done. It couldn't turn it around. The audiovisual has a lot of power. You're working with people who are visually oriented. So there was no amount of written word that could undo what the audiovisual did. So make sure that you have a cliffhanger. If I haven't said it enough times, make sure you have a cliffhanger. Um, so this is a quick overview of what to put there. Now techniques, techniques to open. Whether it's formatted or one-off, I work more in one-off and, and uh, feature length um, and very little pre-formatted uh, or, or factual, as they call it. Um, but the techniques for opening are the same because we are human beings and we tend to react to the same things. Um, four techniques. I have a handout for that. I'm becoming paperless, especially because I'm spending a month in Europe and I don't want to schlep things around. So if you write to me, I will send you whatever handout you want. I wrote over 200 articles about different storytelling issues. So there is one about openings, but I tell you right now, there are four techniques I discover by watching a ton of trailers and working on a lot of films, and my background is in semiotics, so I started to say, why, why is it that I get attracted to this and not to this? When I was an evaluator, I would look at my co-panelists and go, Everybody had a positive reaction, why? It's a very diverse topic, not everybody, why? And I started to take notes and test it. And I found that one of the things that, uh, four things that appeal to people. One is shock or humor. And you might think, well, that's kind of the opposite. It's the same, it appeals to a visceral reaction. You either gasp, oh my God, that's horrible, what happened? Like, I gasped when the fir first line, like, oh, my poor baby, and she was the criminal. I was, oh my God, that's horrible. So a gasp or a laugh, that comes from the same part of the body. It's a very instinctual reaction. Um, believe it or not, there can be humor in documentaries, and I have a bunch of trailers that start with humor. The second technique I discovered was contrast to bring, sorry, a perspective or universality, to put something in a bigger context. So if your topic is very small and you feel, oh, they're gonna say it's too regional, too little, too local, it, it can be brought into a bigger space by putting it in context. So that's what I call contextualizing or perspective. Quick example, I was an evaluator for pitches uh, a while ago, and they said, oh, this is a story about a printing press that is going to be disassembled this weekend. And we all look at each other like, and? That's important because... And um, they said, oh, this is the last printing press. Okay, and it's in Brooklyn, okay. I said, oh, okay, I get it. What you're saying is the first printing press was created in the 1500s by Gutenberg in Germany. The last one in existence is in Brooklyn. It will be disassembled tomorrow. So what we're talking about is the end of an era and the official beginning of the digital era. <coughs> That's huge. So he was using this small piece to talk about a big cultural change. But he was starting by saying, oh, this is a film about a printing press that is going to be disassembled. We couldn't care less. But when he put it in context, suddenly it became the printing press. So very important to contextualize, especially if you have something that might be considered small. Um, the third technique is contrast. How do you bring together, uh, how to bring together two things that don't belong together so you create a little tickle in the brain. Um, so you can start with a scene or the character saying things that are quite contrary to the way she looks. Um, it was this trailer where this very old, lovely granny was saying, well, at this age, all I care about is sex. And it's not the first thing you think of, of a 90-year-old uh, cooking muffins. And it's uh, the story of an erotica artist and how her work has changed uh, when uh, according to her, sex wasn't uh, present in her life, uh, even though she would like to. So, um, bringing together two concepts that don't belong together, it's a good way to create curiosity. The final one um, is um, unresolved statement, 
that's kind of hard to do. I only saw it once working in Scotland uh, with the Scottish Documentary Institute. They were training. And, um, it's when you say something that you cannot really figure out what's about, and then there is a punchline. So here they said, um, this is uh, the story of Bob, who every night goes to the door and has his, hangs a sign saying, Billy, you can come in, there is coffee on the table. It's all affirmative sentences, I get it. Okay, person goes, hangs, sign, but why? Why would anybody do that every day? And the guy was 80 years old, and who's Billy? And what are you saying? Burglars, please, come in, you're welcome. I mean, I, you, it's, it all makes sense, but it doesn't. And then the punchline was, okay, he hangs a sign every night saying, Billy, you can come in, there is coffee on the counter. This is the story of parents of runaway teenagers 30 years after they never came back. So unresolved statement, that's that type of speechless reaction. When you think you're getting something and then the punchline throws you off. It's so hard to do, don't start there. Um, if it happens, great. If not, don't go for it because it, it can look really awkward. Uh, the contrast and perspective are the most common techniques. So uh, the reason I spend so much time with openings is because it's so important to get people in in your first minute that if you don't have good techniques, you're standing to lose. Things not to do, very quickly. No credits in the opening. You can put the title of the film, but that's about it. Uh, no moody pants or fancy stuff that you discover in your new After Effects. Again, go to the character, go to the premise of the film. Um, no montage jumping around either. And um, no ID. No character say, hi, my name is Sarah. I'm 25 and, uh, you know, we don't need an ID. Let the story tell itself. There is a long list of don'ts, but I don't want to overbear you with stuff. We are ready for... Do you have something? Yes, I would like to show you an opening, uh, just one minute. This is from European Project. Um, I get accused of being American, even though I wasn't born in America. So I make an effort to show that I do know the European market too. So I, I, I'm showing something from Leipzig uh, Pitch Forum. I was one of the trainers during the week, well, throughout the program, but during the week leading to. And we had a trailer that had to change because there were some issues. Um, um, are, am I on? Okay, so I will show you just one minute. I want you to take note of what works and what doesn't. Das fünfte schon? Nimm sie Platz. Naja, fehlt mir das schon? Ja. Naja, das ist ein Platz, dann machen wir kein Interview, weil jeder da rein, der ist ein Idiot da praktisch. Jack Unterweger never met his father. He was left by his mother when he was one. He was taken from his grandfather by the welfare department at the age of eight. He had to find his way all on his own. At 25, on charges of murder and four cases of rape, he was sentenced to life in prison. She was already dead. That's a minute, and believe it or not, that's all somebody may see if they're in a rush, and especially in a grant when there are, th when there are 300 proposals and trailers. It's one minute, is it in, is it out, we will watch later, we will watch more later if we liked it. So believe it or not, your fate hangs on that minute. Um, and it's brutal, but that's the way it is. So um, based on what we discussed, ideas of things that could be improved, don't be shy because whatever you say, it will be right. There are so many mistakes. Yeah. Yeah, there is a whole explanation about his whole life history. But the story? So, um, yeah, character, but not the background of the character. Uh, what, what's the story with this character? Something else? Very quickly, we don't have much time. Yeah. Lots of text. Yeah, a lot to read. That should go in the proposal and more in the middle and middle paragraphs, not opening a trailer. Yes? Uh, I 
I'd lose, I'd lose the narrator, the voiceover. I think that's a real a turn off. Yeah, it's a bit of a turn off. Uh, it's not the German accent. It's just that, you know, it, it's explaining things, and I still don't know who this person is. Any, one more comment? No. Okay, let me show you what we did. Yes, tell me. Subtitles. Yeah, you don't like subtitles. Yeah, that's always a challenge. With international projects, unfortunately, you have to subtitle. Um, it's sometimes better to dub, so um, you have to walk the line there. So let me show you, after we discuss the pros and cons uh, of everything, um, we change it. We're going to now catch all the differences. So take note of what's different this time. She was already dead. Das war ja, was ich ja damals gesagt habe, das war ja nur Vortäuschen eines Sexualmordes, um Zeit für die Flucht zu gewinnen. Also auch so eine Panikgeschichte eigentlich. Mit der Stahl wurde er schlagen damals. Also komplette Durchdrehergeschichte, die ich bereue und die mir leid tut, aber ich kann es nicht ändern. Totschläger hieß das Instrument. Nein, das, sind, das hat man geschrieben in den Medien, weil es besser klingt, aber es sind zwei Paar Schuhe. Weil die Stahl darunter ist ja nicht absolut tödlich, nur in meinem Fall durch die vielen Schläge am Kopf und Hals. Uh, hingegen, dass der Totschläger in dem Moment, wo ich zuschlage, schon tödlich ist. You stand like a cool star over my distress, but then you will be near and full of flame. Come, sweetheart, I am here. Take me. I am yours. Dieses Gedicht hat mich wahnsinnig beeindruckt und ich habe natürlich nicht gewusst, dass das von Hesse ist. Ich habe gedacht, das ist von Unterweger. Er hat es als seines sozusagen ausgegeben. Und das hat auch ein wenig mich dazu beeinflusst, mich um ihn mehr zu kümmern, als es ursprünglich gedacht war. Okay, so in the first one, you think the film is going to be about somebody who had a troubled youth. And in this one, what do you discover? Psychopath. It's a psychopath who used manipulation, beautiful poems to seduce women that got him out of jail. Now, that's a story. So the other one was, oh, a very problematic person. How sad, woohoo. And, you know, people in the business see tons of stories. Um, they all, and we have all become a bit cynic. It takes a lot to shock somebody. But a story of somebody who in jail seduces through his writing that was actually a forgery. It was all copied from big uh, poets, but obviously this woman didn't know, and got seduced and got him out of jail. The story is how he manipulated uh, people. Now, the interesting part was when I asked him, he said, oh, there are three films already, but they focus on the crimes and solving the crimes. I want to talk about the skill of a psychopath to manipulate people. This guy got himself out of jail by seducing artists and patrons. I said, oh, so why did you start by writing all this background story? Let's go to the crime and the first woman that was seduced, right then and there. So I just wanted to show you how a first minute can make a huge difference. Um, in the workshop we, in, in March in London, we saw the entire thing and compared the entire thing. Again, this is an overview. Um, Fernanda. Yes. Um, as, as you can see, we're, we're kind of taking a journey through the, through the uh, development and pitching process. Um, but you'll be as aware as I am that uh, there is no journey without some jeopardy. And so <laughs> I'd like to show Fernanda a couple of trailers that she's not seen before and get both your and her instant reaction as to what she thinks about them. That's so, I'm ready, are you up I to think. the challenge? So um, I think the first one we've got, is it ping pong? Is that, yep. So thank you to Hugh and Anson Hartford of uh, um, Banyak Films who've given us permission to use this. We're watching the entire yeah. trailer. Oh, well, we'll have a look, see if I can find a few medals. <laughs> These are all, all at least world European and national. I don't think I've got any, anything lower. Is it raining? 
How many times per week does he play? Does he train? Did they say that? Damasi plays three times a week. Three times a week. Oh, this, I play uh, three and a half. So, some weeks three and another week four. Will he win in China? Um, well, he, <laughs> that is in the lap of the gods. And um, we might just reiterate <coughs> one or two of those verses. That if you think you're beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you'd like to win but think you can't, it's almost sure you won't. You know, etc. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger or fitter man, but sooner or late, the man who wins is the man who thinks he can. And to think I can, I will have to train hard. Nobody expected to live to 84, and here they are playing good table tennis. This, this old girl, I should, I don't care how good she is, I should get her, she can't move, right? This is the first time during my whole career I ran into the table. It must be because of old age. Participating in this competition, ah. you are so old. Oh, not that old. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my husband and I was left alone, and I was flying table tennis, and I think that saved me. It's something to do, it's something to keep my mind. I have had two lots of cancer. But the doctors always said, and the consultants always said, well, keep playing, keep playing. I don't want to go home. I don't want to sit in a chair and watch television and then just die. You can see there are dogs, dogs, this is what? The Huang Qi. And there are also... Four finals, but no, no victory. So in uh, China it will be my last chance. You begin to value your time more as one gets older. As you get near the nearer the winning post, you only think, well, what is at the other side of this kind of barrier? I think we can give the filmmaker a round of applause. <laughs> okay, so is it clear what the story is about? Yes, there is not a single doubt, and that's the most important thing at the end of the day. Regardless of your opening technique, your cliffhanger, your graphics, is the story clear? That's the first question I ask myself when I watch a trailer. And here we get the characters and we get them right off the bat. You see, she doesn't waste any time with any f moody pants or nothing. She went to the guy directly pulling up sub, um, um, medals. Very good use of subtitle. Instead of having the um, characters go, oh, my name is Lacey, oh, my name is Renee, and doing the introduction, just through threw it on the screen with the lower third and the age. So I'm getting, oh, okay, the age is important. Oh, everybody's age is something. So I'm starting to get things through the lower thirds or supers, as they call it. Um, things that you notice that you want to share? Oh, I can comment after, yes. Yes. Hi. Um, I was thinking if we remove the music, would the, mon would the editing, would the pace still work? Yes, but not in the same way. I think it's a mm -hmm. combination of editing skills. Yeah. On the other hand, careful to rely too much on music and say, OK, I don't know if it works, but let's put some music and people will just go up to the tune of it. So careful to, it's a good use, but it's not overused and it's not, the story will work. Um, it will tell the story anyway, so the music is adding. 
Uh, something else that you noticed? Yes, sir. Sorry, if you can repeat, because I'm... Uh, I said, I thought it went on for too long. Mm -hmm. The point was made, I immediately, I got, when, as soon as I got the story, I thought, yeah, I would like to see that, but then mm -hmm. it went on and on. That was the first thing. The second thing is, I thought it was, it was a film that's already made. So here's the question, is it actually a teaser for something that's going to be made, or is it already made? It looks to me like I could watch it, you know, it's, it's out on television next week or something like that. Right, it, it looks more like a teaser. With um, certain, it, this would work great if you are in a pitch forum. Like this is the perfect length and the perfect type of teaser to follow with a longer explanation of what's going on, production stage, uh, other characters, etc. This also would work great on a crowdfunding campaign because it has that. Uh, it's kind of a mix between a marketing trailer that you see at the movie, at the theater, and a, a cinema, and a, and a fundraising trailer. So it's 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 a good mix because you get enough of the story, you get scenes, you get the characters, but not going too deep into anything. It's a great um, teaser for first meetings. If you have a, somebody who's not sold on the idea, or you pitch, and they go, okay, show me something. Once they see the humor and the really lovely characters, they might go for a second meeting. So I would position this teaser as a good tool for those instances. I wouldn't present this for a grant. If you were uh, submitting this for ITVS International, for example, to name a grant that gives a ton of money, like $150,000 roughly, um, this wouldn't cut it. This, uh, it, you know, in a, in a crowdfunding situation, you're raising 10,000, you know, pounds, give and take. In a first meeting, you're just trying to get the ball rolling. But in a high commitment situation, um, like a grant, they need more assurance that these characters can sustain. So you will need it actually longer and move on to particular uh, moments of the story. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Um, just to put that in context, that, um, that was filmed... Uh, the filmmaker went off on his own, used his own money to go and film the, the European Championships. That was the start of his kind of production process. He then cut together this little, little trailer using that footage. Um, and then he kind of, that, that's kind of the end of the film. So he's, he's already, you know, you know, potentially, but then he realised he could go to the um, World Championships. Um, having cut this film, he managed to get the European Ping Pong Association on board to back him. Um, he then pitched it at the Good Pitch and got Puma, um, the Puma Catalyst Fund or maybe the Travel Fund um, to pay for some flights so he could go to Australia to um, cover the birthday celebrations of the lady who's 99 in that film and she's going to be 100. Mm. And then he was looking for more money which he could get and then go and tell the backstories of all these people and kind of tell the stories about ageing and, and the reasons why people played the ping pong and what it meant to them. So just to put that in context. Yes. Can uh, I wrap up with um, cliffhangers? And that's I think it. we probably need to move, move on. because it's like. OK, well, then let me give you a, a quick reminder definition. Um, I said that long definition, the easy way to remember what the trailer is, is a short without an ending. Think that you're making a short, but you're pulling out the ending. Um, we also say that trailers are a premonitory dream of your film, so I hope you can make that dream reality. You can find me, if you want, articles on these things I discuss, or the book will be available with Amber at the end of the session. Um, uh, for articles, you can uh, write to me at info at documentarydoctor.com, or Google my name and you will find me. I will send you any article you want. Well, thank you very much for listening. I hope to see you in the rest of the conference. Thank you. <clears throat> next, next up, I'd like to welcome Richard Satin, who is an executive producer um, with Parthenon. Um, apparently, he made the BBC's very first independently commissioned series, um, Cabaret Jongleurs, and has generated 200 hours of popular factual programming. And he's going to um, tell us about now the, ver the verbal pitch and how, you know, having done all your preparation, this is the bit where you actually go into action. So, Thank welcome. you. I'm also going to show some uh, trailers, but I'm going to leave it till a bit later. So. Um, right, rule number one of pitching. Uh, right, where's rule number one? It's on here somewhere. Oh, yeah. 
don't turn up to pitch with a bunch of unintelligible notes you wrote at 3 a.m. the night before after too many shandies. <laughs> Actually, rule number one is to try and lighten the mood. Uh, get everybody who you're talking to feeling as if they're engaged in the conversation. So it's not a one-way thing, it's a two-way process. Pitching is the toughest thing of all. So you've written your proposal, you've shown your tape, and now it's just either you and a commissioning editor or a hall full of critical people who think they've seen it and heard it all before. Your job is to make them feel they haven't. So this is, you're trying to engage them and persuade them that your idea is something they haven't heard before. One of the first things you need to think about if you're pitching to a commissioning editor in an office is who do you take to that meeting? Uh, and I've been, not one of my projects, but I've been to a, a pitch meeting where there were 11 people. Um, come the end of the half hour, nobody had actually said anything that was of any importance that anybody could remember. So what we tend to do at Parthenon is take the creative instigator, the person who's actually going to make that film. Usually no more than three people. Commissioning editors hate to be put under undue pressure with all of these people who are keen to sell the idea bearing down on them. Before you go in, you have to be prepared. And um, everybody ha has said this already today, and it's absolutely critical. You've got to know the market you're selling to. You have to know what the commissioning editor wants. You have to watch the channels. You have had to have thought about the programs that clearly work for them. There's absolutely no point in going in and pitching an idea that doesn't fill the slots they have available. Um, you need to know what's rating. You need to know what the latest films are so that you can talk about them. They are bound to mention the films that are working. You ought to have seen them. You ought to be able to talk about them constructively or criticize them if that's the way you feel about them. Um, right. There are two kinds of pitching, as I've sort of already intimated. One is the face-to-face -face pitch. Um, the other one is the organized event where you're pitching to a group of people who are in an audience or maybe you've got three minutes and it's a table full of commissioners. Um, both of these require you to be absolutely clear about what your idea is and what you're selling them. Um, so what's the story? Give an absolutely clear and simple description of the subject. Describe who you want this film to reach, what part of their audience you're satisfying. After all, at its most basic, television, cinema is a business, and people are trying to attract an audience, attract advertisers to their channel. So what is the target audience your film is trying to appeal to? Make sure the commissioner is absolutely in no doubt what it is you're looking for. Are you looking for development money? Are you looking for co-production financing? Do you want a full commission? Are you only looking for the finishing money to finish the film? You've got to be absolutely clear about what it is you want, how much money they usually spend on those slots, and what you're looking for. Um, Ask their opinion. I know this is, sounds like a bit of an anathema. You're the creative. You're going in there with an idea that you're trying to convince them about. And yet, you need to leave them with a sense of ownership, as if they feel that this idea is something that they, have, if they had been given the chance, would have thought up themselves. So it's something that automatically lodges in the back of their mind, something that they have an affinity towards. Um, and it is a slightly thin line because on the one hand you want to 
convince them that you, given the money, will have all the creative impetus to make the film, and yet at the other, on the other hand, you want them to be engaged in it in such a way as there is a, there's a two-way conversation. Um, I think I'll show the two clips. Uh, they do actually break all the rules <laughs> um, that you pointed out, but, that Fernanda pointed out, uh, but both of these have been successful. Um, and I'm, sh I'm showing them for two different reasons. One of them has talent attached to it, so it is for all intents and purposes a talent reel. It does touch on what the subject uh, that this particular presenter is going to be dealing with, but the tool is really to sell him as the on-camera talent. Um, the other one is about Hitler. Uh, there have been countless thousands of programs about Hitler. Um, what I think this second trailer does is illustrate how there are still stories left to be told and that if you present it in a certain way, it feels fresh and new. At least that's what we thought as we were making the trailers and fortunately that's what the commissioning editor felt at the end of the uh, session. So can we run those two short clips, please? Walking with Warriors first if possible. I'm Michael Scott, and this year, I'm going to film a series where I will walk in the footsteps of ancient warriors. I've been studying the ancient world for years. Its wars, its soldiers. War was a fundamental part of how the ancients understood themselves. That makes war a great way into understanding the ancient world. And I think, to really understand the ancient world, You've got to become one of those soldiers. You've got to get inside their minds and in their footsteps. It's going to be a tough challenge and I need to get training. When the Romans invaded Britain in 43 AD under Claudius, as they moved north, they came across many major rivers. The enemy was pressing on them. They couldn't build a bridge. They had to wade straight in and across. So to really understand the mentality of the Roman legionary, I'm going to have to get in too. Breathing. To keep moving through this in heavy armor with the mud that slowed me down. The wolf! No! No, there's an enemy waiting for me. What made the Romans so much better was the very fact that they were Roman. It was in their blood. I can't feel my hands and I can't feel my feet. There's no way with an extra, what, 20 kilos of kit that I could now get out and do that. Well, there's an enemy standing on the bank trying to attack me with whatever they've got. This is a real eye-opener for what being Roman really meant. Oh, God. I'm going to be traveling all over the world, visiting archaeological sites, analyzing artifacts, meeting experts, and then I'm going to put myself back in the footsteps of those ancients and experience what they did 2,000 years ago. about five miles and I'm exhausted. But Alexander the Great and his troops did 22,000 miles in the course of 11 years from Greece to the shores of the River Indus in India. It's that ability to go beyond the human that made Alexander the Great so famous and so successful because that reputation preceded him before he'd even turned up on the battlefield. This is the Saracen a weapon of legend, a weapon that changed the ancient world. But it's not until you actually get it in your hands that you understand why, but also how difficult it is to actually use this. We're talking about a seven meter long pole with a very sharp spike on it. The soldiers of Philip and Alexander the Great would have carried this as their principal weapon into battle. Marching along, they would have had it upright, 
but the moment they went to battle, they would have brought it down horizontal. And it's here where the difficulties come, because the moment you put it horizontal, the weight almost trebles in your hand. Already, the biceps, particularly my front arm, are hurting. I had never understood quite how heavy and how difficult this thing is to manipulate until I picked it up right now. It shows you the extraordinary strength that these men must have had. I just kind of realized this is a great, incredible weapon, but also kind of a pointless one. If a man's on his own with this, it's useless. And any force that was able to get behind my unit would be able to chop us to pieces quickly. This only works, it only has value as a weapon, as part of a lightning charge from a coordinated unit. So this weapon may have dominated the ancient world, but it would only work if it was going up against people who didn't realize how easily it could have been broken. And in this series, it's gonna get even tougher. No hot drinks, no painkillers, no hot food, all the way to becoming a soldier of the ancient world. After everything I've been through, this is all I have to look forward to tonight. Campfire and a bowl of this, Spartan broth that the Spartan army fed themselves upon wherever they went. It's boiled pig's blood, pork and vinegar. A resident of Sybaris, a city in Sicily, once said that once he tasted this, he understood why Spartans were so willing to die quite so quickly on the battlefield. <laughs> Cheers. That is pretty disgusting. I'm, I think I'm with Sibaris on this. The key thing about understanding this stuff is that this was an active choice. They decided to eat something like this. It's not just about what the Spartans could do, it's what their reputation was, that they ate this kind of stuff, that they could do these kinds of things. This is why I love history, because it allows you to get back into the footsteps and the mindsets of the people who lived all around us so many centuries ago. Cheers. Too long. <laughs> Too much text. Uh, oh, no, no. But it, it, the reason why that is so long is because it's a six-part series and we actually had to describe virtually every element that was going into it. Um, apparently I've only got another three minutes, so there's a quick bit of Hitler, because you can't not have a bit of Hitler if you're making <laughs> documentaries, allegedly. During the First World War, Hundreds of thousands of soldiers are subjected to constant bombardment in death-filled trenches. Many survivors are afflicted with bouts of debilitating depression and physical pain in the aftermath of mustard gas poisoning. But this man undergoes an epiphany. This man is Adolf Hitler. The extraordinary thing is that the war has transformed this person in the sense of believing that he has been singled out with a particular mission to save Germany. We know what Hitler became. I don't think anybody will probably actually seriously rival him in the consciousness of being probably the most evil man we've ever seen. What has eluded historians is why this terrible transformation happened. Until now. Munich, August 1914. A jubilant crowd greets the news of the outbreak of war. Amongst the masses is a penniless drifter, Adolf Hitler, age 25. For years, Hitler had tried to make a living as an artist. In the winter of 1909-1910, Hitler was, to all intents and purposes, a vagrant, um, sleeping on park benches, in public shelters, unshaven, and pretty verminous as well. Without hesitation, Hitler joins the German army and is sent to the Western Front. He certainly was not a shirker, he was not a coward, and it's pretty clear that this was you know, that almost the happiest time of his life. The trenches become Hitler's home. He'd been drifting up to the beginning of the war, now he's found his true vocation as fighting for Germany. But this doesn't mean that he is one of the lads. 
the other troops regarded him as a bit of an oddball. Documents reveal Hitler begins as a dispatch runner on the front line and never rises above the rank of Lance Corporal. But in 1916, he fights at the Somme. Hitler is injured in an explosion. Hospitalized for months, he claims this is where his anti-Jewish thoughts are formulated. Returning to the front in October 1918, Hitler suffers another devastating assault on his senses, a British gas attack. His troop is decimated. Hitler survives. But the poison has a profound effect on his health. The psychological impact is even more crippling. A widespread sickness among soldiers, it is known as shell shock. Their minds have simply broken down under the pressure of war. We would now call that maybe combat fatigue or acute stress disorder. New scientific research argues that after being gassed, Hitler shows all the signs of post-traumatic stress. Now, supporting evidence has been found buried in US archives. In 1943, an American intelligence agent interviewed a doctor who was present at the psychiatric hospital Hitler was sent to in 1918. The report records how Hitler is diagnosed with blindness brought on by hysteria. Today, hysterical blindness is known to be triggered by a traumatic event. At some level they can see, but they don't believe they can see. Hysterical blindness is still around. Uh, it's not very common, but it's still recognized. For the first time, Hitler's psychological condition can be revealed. The draconian treatment methods, the dramatic recovery. His vision restored, Hitler believes his survival is God's will. His fate is to enter politics and avenge Germany's defeat. For the doctor who treated him, it is a death sentence. As Hitler rises to power, he attempts to cover up any traces of his mental frailty. In 1933, in an apparent suicide, the doctor is found dead at his home. This is the true story of how the horrors of the First World War turn Adolf Hitler from an aimless failure into a maniacal mass murderer. War was the ultimate transformative experience for him. Without the war, we don't have the Hitler that we know the post-war. If we had interviewed him in 1914 or in whenever, the one thing we'd have concluded quite categorically, whatever Hitler was, he wasn't insane. That's Thank it from me. Thank you. So we, we have a few minutes uh, for questions, if anybody has questions. We do have a roving microphone. Um, if you could wait for the microphone, say who you are, and say who you are addressing your question to. Um, any questions? This lady over here. Hi, Bryony Dunn. My question is to the gentleman, I'm sorry, verbal Richard. pitch. Richard. Thank you, Richard. Richard, during the pitch, yes, you want an engagement, so a to and fro asking opinions and questions, but apart from being clear about how you want the pitch to end, you know what you want to get out of it, what do you, how do you end it? Do you sort of leave them to think about it? Like, are there, are there tricks about how to end it, or is it a case-by-case -case basis? I think it is case by case. Um, you know, in an ideal world, you'll come out of that meeting and they'll have offered you the money and you'll be going off to make the film. But much more likely that the information you've imparted, the discussions you've had in that meeting will throw up all kinds of new ideas that perhaps you hadn't put in your original pitch or even thought through before you've gone in to do the verbal pitch. Um, I think on in most cases, in my experience, there is a supplementary document that goes back in. And then, of course, the trick is to make sure that that gets into the hands of the right person, that you follow it up without being a pest, that you keep that, en keep that engagement going for as long as you possibly can. Um, you know, it's very easy for a commissioner who has 300 proposals crossing their desk every week to forget the one that you've delivered them the week before. So making yourself present, whether it's, you know, engaging them on a personal level, trying to find out, you know, go to, go to the, the offices, 
call up for meetings and all the rest of it, that's absolutely critical. Otherwise, yeah, there's a very good chance your idea will drift to the bottom of the pile. Okay, thank you. I think there's, was there somebody over here as well? Hi, um, Leah Philcox. Um, similar thing, just to clarify the difference between the verbal and the written pitch. I mean, in the verbals, you basically say what you've written, but get the conversation going as well. I mean, do you have to repeat everything you've put into your written? Well, I think you repeat the, you summarize. Yeah. You describe all the unique selling points of the document you've sent in, which, if you got it right in the first place, could be as short as half a page a page. Um, just to remind them, I also take in a whole series of bullet points, uh, which are the essential elements, plus something new. Always a good idea to leave something out of the uh, written proposal, so you actually have something to add, um, so that you don't get asked just preconceived questions, that there's something new that you can engage on. Um, so yeah, I and I actually hand the bullet points to the commissioning editor. So there's no sort of distraction from the conversation we're having. Uh, and I make it very clear about what it is I'd like to you know, run through by the end of the meeting. There's nothing worse than getting to the end of the meeting and only having done a third of the pitch. OK, thank you. Thank you. Is there any more questions but maybe over this side? No? Oh, yes, down the front. Hi, um, I'm Valentina Ippolito. Um, just to clarify something, because I'm a lecturer and um, I, I just need to know so that I tell my students the right information. Um, is a proposal written, it's just a language um, point, is a proposal written in the future and the synopsis in the present? Because when you write a synopsis, you write about a film that exists beyond. Um, audiences, it's there. But when you write a proposal, it's for Andra. Uh, do you talk about it in the future, or do you talk about it as a project that has got its own? I mean, we we all, I imagine, write proposals and do tastes yes. and do pitching. But um, I tend to write um, specialist factual and current affairs that that type of proposal. Um, I quite often start a paragraph with, "In this program, we will." It's, it's a positive statement, it's a, a future statement. Um, it's, yeah, so you're, you are kind of writing the future. It's what this program will be when we make it. Um, but again, different people write in different ways, so I just think it's quite a positive, forward-looking. Yeah. In, in America, if you're submitting two grants over there, it's present tense, everything, even if you haven't shot a single frame. You say, this character does this and then does this, as if you were watching the film. The idea is that gives you the, the, the impression that you are in the film and they're very suspicious. I mean, as an opening sentence, I understand we will do this, um, but once in describing the story, they, they want the present tense in general, in general. Have we got time for one, maybe one more? Maybe just one very quick one. One short question. Anybody? I just wanted to give everybody something to uh, uplift them on their way out. Uh, there is no such thing as a dead idea. Um, given that the idea that you're trying to present has been thought of a thousand times before, uh, it's your approach to that idea that is absolutely critical. So you're bringing something new to that idea, a new way of telling it, a new character, a new, you know, a new facet. Um, but I just want to tell you one quick story. There was a commissioning editor at the BBC who ran the Time Watch department, which was a historical strand that I think ended a couple of years ago. Um, and I had got permission to film on the last Concorde flight. Uh, so we proposed a program that basically it was upbeat, funny, it was all the quirky stories about Concorde, you know, the Mile High Club, all of that stuff with a bit of technology thrown in. And he was coming to the office, our office was in Wardour Street, to say that he wasn't going to do it because he had a whole range of other projects. Um, that, and our film just didn't fit his slot. And as he was walking down Wardour Street, Concord flew overhead. And everybody stopped and looked up at the sky. And by the time he came up the stairs, he decided to commission it. <laughs> 
because everybody is fascinated by this gleaming silver bird and the luxury and, and all the rest of it, and he was smitten. So any lingering doubts he had, which were quite serious at that point, were dispelled. Excellent. So never give up. No, never very, give very, up. very good advice uh, from all our panellists. I'm sure you'll agree. Um, please join me in thanking Fernanda, Richard and Andrea. <laughs> Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, if you'd like to win um, these books, a goodie bag from DFG, a year's uh, membership to DFG, and $100 consultation towards a consultation with Fernanda, then please fill in the uh, forms that you have, hand them in uh, on your way out. Uh, and there's some books available. Oh, and Fernanda has some books available to buy also on the way out. And um, the draw will take place after the pitch, which is following... The, the DFG pitch supported by the Grierson Trust, it starts at 4pm. We've got six pitchers who are coming to, uh, well, pitch for up to £10,000 worth of development funding for a single story dock um, aimed at a UK audience, UK based idea. Um, yeah, very exciting. And that's going to be um, winding up at about half past five and we'll do the draw at around the same time. Yeah, so, so if you can get your um, pieces of paper in by half past five, that's the deadline. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs>